during this lecture, I want to talk about the notion of a living constitution. Um, in our previous lecture, we talked about originalism. This is the main uh, alternative to originalism, the notion that the Constitution is a dynamic document that has the potential to change over time. Uh, and that is not only uh, something they think is, is, is true just because it's true, but they also imagine and hope uh, that it would change over time to reflect changing conditions, changing circumstances, whether they be social uh, or economic uh, in nature. Um, and like with originalism, there are two different ways that we can begin to understand where this notion comes from. Why would somebody come up with this idea uh, and, and uh, as, a, as a mode of constitutional interpretation? Um, and one of them is, is a very, like with originalism, it has a very pragmatist side. This one has a pragmatist side uh, as well. Um, and, and that is simply one that, that th this idea that we should not uh, be ruled by the dead hand of the past. Originalists will say to living constitutionalists, um, you, can't, you can't understand the Constitution this way uh, unless you amend the Constitution. Uh, in one of our other lectures, we, we, we saw how difficult it is to amend the Constitution. Uh, so a living constitutionalist would ask, or maybe they're not, or a soon-to-be living constitutionalist would say, well, well, why not? Why should the Constitution be so hard to change if, if, if this issue that I'm concerned about is so important and a majority of Americans are so concerned about it? It doesn't make any sense that our foundational document wouldn't give us uh, an avenue or a vehicle through which uh, to, to change uh, to change structures of government in such a way as they operate, to make them operate better, or to recognize new rights that we've decided are now fundamental and important for various reasons. Um, so again, we, why should we be ruled by the dead hand of the past? Why should conception uh, from the past rule us uh, today? There is a theoretical side, though, uh, to the notion of a living constitution. Um, and it, and it, is an, it is an idea that we've talked about before in other lectures, and, and it comes from uh, the great legal and political philosopher Ronald Dworkin. And that's the idea uh, that the founders had in mind uh, not specific conce conceptions of, say, what your privileges or immunities were or what due process meant. They instead understood them as concepts, not conceptions. So this very large amorphous concept, privileges and immunities, they might have had particular conceptions of what they were at some point in time. But if we understand them as categories instead of, of, of a kind of open-ended categories instead of as limited categories, though, we can, we can imagine that we would have different conceptions, and we honestly do, over time and at different times of what those privileges uh, or immunities are or what, cruel, what is cruel and unusual punishment. So again, this theoretical idea bound with this intent idea is that um, the Constitution is written in general terms, right? In, in, the, the, it's their general conceptions under which, or general concepts under which different conceptions uh, can fall. And of course, over time, uh, that will change. Um, but we can understand, so, so we can understand kind of a, a practical, pragmatic end of, of the notion of a living Constitution, and we can understand a theoretical one. But this notion really didn't take off in the United States. In other words, we didn't have, at the, at the very least, many jurists who adopted this approach uh, to constitutional interpretation until the beginning of the 20th century. And I want to talk just a little bit for a few minutes about why that is the case. In other words, to situate the beginning of the notion of a living constitution in historical time. And there's no way to understand it. Uh, there's no way to understand it without without situating in historical time, as you'll soon see. The late 19th century in the United States, and in fact in the entire Western world, changed significantly as a result of the Industrial Revolution. Uh, America, for example, was increasingly becoming less agricultural and more urban, right? more manufacturing. When you look at demographic shifts in the United States in the late 19th century, you see less people living on farms, say, in the center of states. Let's take Pennsylvania. We see less people move, living in the, in, in the center of Pennsylvania and more people moving to the urban manufacturing cities of Pittsburgh and Philadelphia on either end. 
and there was rapid change, right? We, we get the, uh, during and immediately after the Civil War, the completion of the Transcontinental Railroad. Now goods and even services can move with lightning speed relative to the way that they could have uh, just a decade before uh, in the United States. Um, so these changes, though, uh, particularly manufacturing changes in the United States, um, become the, 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 the source of a lot of disagreement uh, among Americans. For example, um, with the rise of, of urban manufacturing, for example, uh, say you're a new immigrant to the United States and you're working in a steel mill. Um, steel mills uh, today are still pretty dangerous, but I can assure you, in 1895, they were extremely dangerous. Many deaths, many injuries, some permanent and horrible and heinous. So what if you, what if you get your arm lopped off in the steel mill because the owner of the steel mill uh, didn't have the right equipment or didn't provide you with um, 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 some kind of safety training or something like that? Did you have any recourse? Um, you probably didn't. So what, and at the same time, uh, you might not have any recourse, but you also have your uh, nine-year-old son working, uh, working in the mines. What kind of recourse does he have if he gets hurt? Probably none. What is he probably making? What are his wages? They're probably extremely low, too. So with this rise of, of industrialization in the 19th century, we started to see on the state level state legislatures, democratic majorities, elected democratic majorities, try to rein in what they perceive to be the, the nefarious effects of the Industrial Revolution in the United States. Not that they didn't like it, but to try to rein in and curb some of the side effects. And we started to see, um, uh, as Professor Robertson was talking about in the Bradwell case, the passage of maximum hours legislation, minimum wage legislation, workers' compensation legislation on the state level. Well, you can imagine that those who own the steel mills uh, didn't like this. They didn't like having to uh, say to somebody, uh, well, I, can, I want you to work 120 hours a week, and then responding, no, I can only, I'm only regular. I can only work 60 hours a week, because this is a dangerous industry. Um, they certainly didn't like the idea of, of workers' compensation. So they challenged these laws. And for the most part, the vast, vast majority of them that reached the Supreme Court were overturned as unconstitutional. The court said no to maximum hours legislation, to minimum wage, workers' compensation structures, for the most part. They said no. Uh, more than likely, uh, understanding uh, of, of, of originalist uh, intent um, to the Constitution, uh, they found that either in the Liberty Clause of the 14th Amendment, um, states uh, could not uh, trample upon or, or abrogate what they perceived to be a liberty of contract that we all had. Um, if you have maximum hours legislation in your state, that prevents the worker uh, from negotiating or contracting with his boss for as many or as little hours as they're able to come to terms about. If you have, max, if you have minimum wage legislation, it prevents the owner and the worker from coming to terms uh, about how much money they're going to make. But that violates liberty of contract. On the national level, as we'll talk about in a little bit, um, the Commerce Clause of the Constitution, Congress can regulate commerce, but what does commerce mean? Now, common, the understanding of commerce, though, is changing because of the Industrial Revolution, Move, moving from an agricultural, agriculturally based economy uh, to a manufacturing based economy. Well, while the, it's one thing, though, to uh, strike down state legislation, and by the way, this period is called the Lochner period, uh, based on a famous case in New York called Lochner versus New York, um, which involved uh, the New York State Legislature passed uh, a bill that said, a maximum hours legislation bill, that said the bakers could not work more than 60 hours a week in the bakery. And the legislature did this uh, because they conducted tests and determined that the inhalation of dust, whether it be from the ground or the, or the, or the, or the bread and flour, um, was dangerous. And that no more than 60 hours a week, or more than 60 hours a week spent in that environment uh, uh, could be detrimental to your health. You could imagine that the owner of the bakery was very upset about that, um, increased wage co labor costs, et cetera. The court strikes that down. Uh, Justice Peckham um, says that this violates some, some idea of liberty of contract that's so fundamental uh, to American uh, constitutional culture. Um, but he here's where uh, a lot of people like to, to kind of date this, give a start date to the notion of a living constitution. Because it's in that case that 
Justice Oliver Wendell Holmes and Louis Brandeis dissent. Or Brandeis wasn't on the court yet, I'm sorry, Oliver Wendell Holmes. And Holmes says that the court should not stand in the way of a dominant public opinion. Probably understanding a, 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 the understanding of what would later become to be known as the counter-majoritarian difficulty, which, which we talked about. If the Constitution doesn't absolutely prohibit something, and a majority of the people want it, the court should not stand in their way. In other words, the only time that they should stand in their way is if what one majority wants is blatantly unconstitutional. So Holmes and then later Brandeis would work together in developing uh, this notion. Um, let's get back to the historical end of this. State, the, constant, uh, the court was striking down uh, this kind of legislation on the state level. Uh, but then something happened in 1929 that we all know about concerning the economy. We have the stock market crash and the ensuing Great Depression. Well, President Roosevelt, in an effort to get us out of the Depression and uh, in hopes of developing legislation to prevent something like that from happening before, passes a whole series of, of pieces of legislation uh, based on, on, on lots of provisions of the Constitution, uh, most specifically uh, most often the Commerce Clause of Article I, Section 8, which allows Congress to, to regulate commerce among the several states uh, and with the tribes. Um, and what did the court do? Now remember, this is for the most part the same court from the Lochner period uh, just 30 years or 28 years earlier. They strike it down. They strike it down. Um, well, one of the most interesting things about, the FDR, about FDR's uh, presidency in terms of domestic politics uh, was the court packing plan. The president said, you know what, we shouldn't be, we shouldn't be uh, um, held hostage by uh, a court that has a conception of what the Commerce Clause means from the horse and buggy days. He actually got that term from his driver who would drive him from the White House to press conferences and had made the same uh, claim about the court being living in the horse and buggy days. Roosevelt famously uh, um, you know, threatens to pack the court uh, to pass, to have his democratically controlled uh, um, Congress uh, pass legislation that would have mandatory retirement ages and increase the amount of justices on the Supreme Court. So he would automatically have uh, the ability to pack the court with those who was sympathetic to his legislative agenda. Um, and they would have to be judges uh, that would have a, a more progressive notion of constitutional, this notion of a living constitution uh, to be able to rationalize this tremendous amount of federal power that, would, that you would need to uh, condone to have uh, the kind of legislation that, that, that he wanted, Social Security, um, the FDIC, all kinds of, of, of programs. Um, we know, though, that that bill fails. Uh, but the court, nevertheless, uh, in, in terms of commerce, uh, defers to um, Congress and, in a sense, promises never uh, to, to stick its head into the area of determining what is commerce and what isn't. Uh, and in fact, from 1937 to 1995, uh, the Supreme Court does not overturn or strike down a single law uh, as violative of the, of the Commerce Clause of the Constitution. So that, th those are really the beginnings of the notion of a living Constitution, that certain clauses should be interpreted um, um, or understood as or, uh, organic or as, as living things that can be molded to um, the various crises of human affairs, as one justice um, put it. Um, I, I'm going to give you two examples of, of how this plays out. Um, an early example, and then, and then one from the mid-20th century very quickly. Um, in the case Missouri versus Holland in 1920, uh, right after the Civil War, uh, Congress for many years uh, had tried to pass uh, legislation regulating uh, hunting and, and gaming. Um, and they weren't able, to, sometimes they were able to pass it, sometimes they weren't. Um, many, many states thought this was a states' rights issue, that only states had control over these, uh, over these issues, even though birds uh, do fly across state lines. Uh, and how do we know if they don't, unless we track them all or something like that. Um, so what Congress, what the president did um, was enter into a treaty with Great Britain regarding Canada's birds. So who, would who in the United States would then regulate uh, migratory birds? You know, when you can, can you shoot them, can you not, et cetera, et cetera. Um, it would be Congress. But they, again, they couldn't get this passed. It, it would, 
they couldn't get this passed in Congress. But we have to understand that the treaty provisions of the Constitution say that you get a treaty passed if the president and, and, and a third of the Senate, two thirds of the Senate say it's good. Then it's a treaty. But then you look at the end of the Constitution, the end of the Constitution, one of the last provisions says that all treaties, right, are applicable here in the United States. In other words, they, they're the law of the land. So you can, in a sense, skip the normal legislative process uh, by entering into a treaty that has to do with domestic provisions. Um, well, the court, led by Holmes, says this is not a problem. And he says, we should understand uh, the Constitution and its words in the light of our whole experience, the whole history of what has come before us in giving meaning to different provisions of the Constitution. Um, 38 years later, in, in Trop versus Dulles, um, we have another example of, of no, the notion of a living Constitution. Um, here, this was, this was the result of uh, a soldier who was uh, d dishonorably discharged um, and then couldn't get a passport because if you were dishonorably discharged, um, you, in a sense, had your citizenship revoked. Uh, and he made the argument that this was cruel and unusual punishment. Um, but Chief Justice Earl Warren said, he said, well, I agree with you. Um, so how are we to understand what, the, what cruel and unusual punishment means then? Well, he says, we have to understand it in terms of evolving standards of decency. So there you can understand how we wouldn't be fixed by one meaning in the past as originalism would have it. The notion of a living constitution would say, as Warren did here, when we look at these concepts like cruel and unusual punishment, right, we have to give meaning to them as our evolving standards of decency change. Maybe at one period of time we thought it was all right uh, to execute people who were 16 years old, put to death those who are under 18 or something like that. Uh, maybe we don't today. And the, and originalism would handcuff us uh, to the dead hand of the past uh, with that. A notion of a living constitution uh, would allow it to be flexible enough uh, uh, to, to solve uh, real significant problems that democratic majorities wanted to. Thank you. Freedom 101 is made possible by generous support from Woody Young, and the University of Oklahoma Alumni Association. Freedom 101 is a program of the Institute for the American Constitutional Heritage at the University of Oklahoma. For more videos and podcasts, visit freedom.ou.edu. Thank you.